Continuing on with lesson 2.3. We're going to conclude our factoring portion with factoring differences of perfect squares. If you have the difference of two perfect squares, the factors can be separated into their square roots, one with addition and one with subtraction. Let's see how that works. We have factoring for x squared minus 16. If we think about splitting them up as a difference of perfect squares, x squared would just be simply x in parentheses being squared. Minus 16 would be the same as 4 squared. The x and the 4 are like a and b. If we split them up into a product of smaller factors with these two perfect squares, one parenthesis is addition and one parenthesis is subtraction. It doesn't matter which one has the plus or the minus. One of them would be x plus 4 and the other x minus 4. If we FOIL to check them, what would end up happening is the middle term would cancel out and then you'd be left with x squared minus 16. Let's try another one. x squared and then we have minus 100. For this one, if we take a look at splitting up the x or the two perfect squares, Again, x just stays x, or x squared stays x, and then 100 would be the same as 10 squared. Now this only works for subtraction. When we split this up to the two smaller parentheses, one is addition and one is subtraction. It's that quick and easy to factor. The last example has an a out in front. And typically, that would mean we'd have to do the A times C split the B method from part one, but we wouldn't have to here. Nine is a perfect square with X squared, and 64 is a perfect square. But now we have to think about how we would rewrite them. If we have 9X squared as a parenthesis, we'd have to take the square root of 9 and X squared, and that would just be 3X, just like that. And 64 is the same as 8 squared. Now our a and our b are 3x and 8. If we split them up into a product of smaller parts, we would have 3x plus 8 and 3x minus 8. And there's factoring the difference of perfect squares. When you write an equation in factored form, that would be when you split it up into a product of smaller parts. The template is y equals a times x minus p times x minus q. And they can be positive or negative, and you can have that common factor of a out in front if necessary. When we're in factored form, we can find the zeros or x-intercepts of a function. The p and the q in the equation are the representatives for the x-intercepts. Let's take a look at the example on the right. Factor the expression x squared plus 2x minus 8. How do the factors of the graphed function relate to the factors of the function? Let's take a look. If we start off with x squared plus 2x minus 8, we're asked to factor. The coefficient in front of x squared isn't written, therefore it defaults to 1. And remember, if the factor or if the coefficient is 1, then all we need to do is split the c va value to get the b value on the inside. So what are factors or numbers that go into negative 8? We could do 1 and 8 or 2 and 4. In some way, we need to make them multiply to get negative 8 and add to get positive 2. I think that eliminates 1 and 8 right away. If we think about 2 and 4, if we make the 2 negative and keep the 4 positive, that would give us a product of negative 8 and a sum of positive 2. We split the x squared into x times x, and then we put our minus 2 in one location and our plus 4 in the other location. So notice our x-intercepts on the graph. Those are the zeros of the function. Those are interchangeable words, so just make sure you are familiar with both sets of terminology. Our x-intercepts or our zeros are at negative 4, 0 and at 2, 0. How do they relate to those factors? Well, if we took those factors and set them equal to 0 to solve, we would get negative 4 and positive 2. So that's our connection with factoring. The purpose of factoring is to help us find those zeros on the graph 
or where they cross the x-axis. Here's how we can use factoring to help us solve. Whenever you're asked to solve quadratics, if you're using factoring as your method, you want to make sure your equation is set equal to zero first, and then you factor. The solving comes from the zero product property. Once you've split your quadratic into that product of smaller parts, set each parenthesis equal to zero and then solve for x. Those will give you your zeros or your x intercepts. In the first example on the right, it says solve the equations by factoring x squared plus 1x minus 42 equals 0. So it's already set equal to 0. Now we need to factor. Taking a look at the a value, the a value is 1, so that means we just have to split the c value, 42. We want negative 42 when we multiply and positive 1 for x in the middle when we add. Ooh, there are a lot of factors of 42. We could do 1 and 42, we could do 2 and 21, we could do 3 and 14, we could also do 6 times 7. Out of those four pairs, it looks like the only pair that we could possibly work with to get 1 in the middle would be that last set, 6 and 7. They would multiply to get 42, but we could figure out a way to combine them to get 1 for the coefficient of b. We need them to be negative 42, therefore we need to have one number negative and one number positive. To get positive 1 in the middle, we would need to make 6 negative and keep the 7 positive. To keep this now, or to write it in factored form, we'll do our two parentheses. We'll split apart the x squared into x times x, minus 6 and plus 7. So there's our factor part. Now we'll apply that zero product property if each parenthesis is set equal to zero separately, we're just going to solve from there. And this goes pretty quick. If we add 6 to move it over, we get x equals 6. That's one of the zeros for our function. If we take x plus 7 and set it equal to zero, we'd have to subtract 7. And x would equal negative 7. So our zeros are 6, 0 as one ordered pair and negative 7, 0. Make sure you watch your directions on Savas, whether they want you to type it in as an integer, which would just be 6, or as an ordered pair, which would be 6, 0. For the example on the right, 2x squared equals negative 9x plus 5. The first thing we're supposed to do is set the equation equal to 0 and factor. So we have to move some things around first. I'm going to keep the 2x squared on the left so that our lead coefficient is positive. That means I'll have to add 9x to both sides and subtract 5. This gives us 2x squared plus 9x minus 5 is equal to 0. All right, I want you to pause the video and see if you can factor this quadratic function. Since a is 2, we're going to have to multiply a times c and split to get b. Once you have it factored, press play, and then we'll solve. For my two factors, I got 2x minus 1 and x plus 5. You can write the parentheses in either order, but you have to have 2x minus 1 in one of the parentheses and x plus 5 in the other one. If you didn't get that, look at the work that I have and see if you can figure out where things maybe went in a different direction. If you want me to look at your work in class, I would be happy to do so as well. All right, let's solve this now by applying the zero product property. If we set 2x minus 1 equal to 0, we would have to add 1 first and then divide by 2. And we would get x equals 1 half, or the ordered pair would be 1 half comma 0. If we set x plus 5 equal to 0, this one's a little bit faster, we'll just subtract 5 and x would equal negative 5, or as an ordered pair, negative 5, 0. And those would be your x-intercepts or zeros of that quadratic function. All right, let's try some application. It says Marco hits a golf ball into the air from the third level of a driving range that has 48 feet high. The function h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 32 t plus 48 gives the height in feet of the ball after t seconds in which it was hit into the air. 
When will the ball hit the ground? Whoops, I was trying to underline that and that did not get underlined at all. When will the ball hit the ground? Well, if the ball is going to hit the ground, that means the height is zero. And that's what we set our equation equal to. Wow, look at this equation though. If we have negative 16 t squared plus 32 t plus 48, if we want to set it equal to zero, that would help us determine when it would land on the ground with a height of zero. Notice A, ooh, it's negative 16. That means we'd have to multiply negative 16 times 48 and try to come up with factors that get 32 in the middle. Unless you remember our key first step. Anytime we factor, we're supposed to check for a common factor. We have 16, 32, and 48. Believe it or not, 16 will go into all three of those coefficients. That's pretty impressive. I'm also going to factor the negative with that 16 out. And that just changes the sign on the inside. If we recognize that we can factor negative 16, in that first term, all that's left is t squared. That should make it a lot easier to factor. If we factor negative 16 out of positive 32t, that would be minus 2t. And if we factor negative 16 out of 48, negative 16 would go into positive 48 negative 3 times. And wow, all of a sudden we've got a tinier quadratic to have to factor. With that negative 16 out in front, get this you guys, we can just divide it. If it doesn't have a t with it, it's just a constant. So we can divide it on each side because on the right, zero, minus, or zero divided by negative 16 would stay zero. And now we just have t squared minus 2t minus 3 equals zero. And now that the a value is 1, we just need to split the c. For negative 3, we can only use 1 and 3 to get that, but we want negative 2 in the middle. This time I think we need to make the 3 negative. That way, when we multiply, we would get negative 3, but when we add, we'd get negative 2 for the b in the middle. To factor then, we'll do our product of two parentheses. The t squared will split into t times t, and then we have plus 1 and minus 3. Apply the zero product property and set each parenthesis equal to zero. If we set our first parenthesis equal to zero, we get negative one. That means negative one seconds. Does that make any sense? No, that doesn't make sense. So hopefully the other problem will give us the result we need. If we have t minus three and we add three to the other side, we would get t equals three. So in three seconds, the ball will land on the ground. We'll go ahead and skip example 4b and move down to examples 5 and 6. Back in topic 1, we talked about positive and negative intervals. We're going to do that again with quadratic functions. It's positive when the values for the output are above the x-axis, and it's negative when the values are below the x-axis. But remember with positive and negative intervals, we're looking at x values that make it happen. We're not looking at anything with our output. Example five, identify the intervals on which the function y equals x squared minus two x minus three is positive. So we just looked at x squared minus two x minus three for the golf ball problem. Let's see what we can do here. The first thing you wanna do is find the zeros. So that means we're going to factor and the zeros are on the x-axis. We'll use those answers to write our interval solution. If we set our function equal to zero, we would get x minus three and x plus one. We talked about that before. If we set them each equal to zero separately, we would get x equals positive three and x equals negative one. I'm gonna plot those two points. We have positive three, and then we have negative one. So we are just going to do a really basic sketch of this graph. 
The A value is one, so it's positive. That means the arrows point up. What I'm going to do is just draw a curve going down and up, something like that. When asked to determine if the values are positive, I want to know for what values on the x-axis is the graph above the x-axis. What that means is we're looking for the x values for this portion of the graph and this one over here on the right when it's above. Our positive intervals, remember we write them from left to right, so that means we're going to go from negative infinity all the way over here to positive infinity. Well, anything from negative infinity to that first zero, our graph is above the x-axis, making it positive. From negative infinity to negative one, we have a positive interval. And then from negative one over to three, it goes below the x-axis, but then at three, it goes back up to positive infinity again. So it's, or it goes up on the graph, so it's positive. From three to infinity, the graph has a positive set of outputs. All right, one final example. Our final process, write the equation of the parabola or of a parabola in factored form. Our template will be y equals a times x minus p times x minus q. If you're asked to write an equation in factored form, you should be given the x-intercepts for the function. You'll plug those in first for p and q. Then you'll have to have another point somehow either on the graph or in the given information and you'll use that to point to solve for a. You'll plug those numbers in for x and y. Once you get your a value, you just write your equation. Here's how it works. It says write an equation of a parabola with x-intercepts of negative 2 and negative 1. Those would be our p and our q values through the point negative 3, 20. So we'll use those values for x and y. Step one though, we're just going to write our equation, y equals a times x minus p and x minus q. If p is negative two and we plug it in for x minus p, that's a double negative. So that will actually change that to positive. q is negative one, so the same thing will happen there, x minus negative one. I'm just going to change both of those to positive, and that would give us y equals a times x plus 2 times x plus 1. Now that other point, the negative 3, 20, what that means is in this equation, if we let y equal 20 and x equal negative 3, we should be able to determine what a equals. That's the only variable left in the equation. So I substituted in negative 3 for x and 20 for y. Now the two parentheses on the right, negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. Notice for this problem, this is all multiplication on that right-hand side. a times negative 1 times negative 2 would just be positive 2a. To get a by itself, divide both sides by 2 and a would equal 10. That is your lead coefficient. Last but not least, we're going to take it in this row right here and substitute it in. Your equation will be y equals 10 times x plus 2 times x plus 1. And that's all we can do with quadratic functions in factored form.